Okay, we're going to go on a little journey. I'll start, interestingly enough, because Jeff did mention uh, Central Europe and the former Eastern Bloc. We'll start there. Um, about 25 years ago, actually, a little less than 25 years ago, I found myself standing in the middle of Central Europe where I had been living when I finished graduate school, and I was an election monitor. And I monitored and witnessed and viewed very closely uh, the pre-color revolutions of the era. Uh, this is immediately after the fall of communism, some of the first elections that occurred in Central and Eastern Europe, despite the popular mythology, were not democratic elections with the groundswell of support uh, for democracy. In fact, they were managed and manipulated by the United States of America in order to assure a particular outcome. And that outcome was to reelect communists. And I know that sounds strange, and it certainly doesn't fit the narrative, uh, but why would you want to reelect communists in an era that had just thrown communism off? Well, communists were great for the deep state in the US because they knew how to take orders. They knew how to do what they were told. They knew when a strong power told them to do something and promised them all the goodies that they would continue to enjoy that they have enjoyed for so long under communism, they would do it. They were compliant. On the other side of that coin, there were the evil populists, people like Franjo Tudjman in Croatia, people like Vladimir Mečiar in Slovakia, who were populists, they were strong anti-communists, and they did not want to trade the old boss for a new boss. These people had to be undermined and prevented, and they were also by and large Christians rather than uh, atheists or pagans, what the communists were. They had to be prevented from being anywhere near the seat of power. So they all became far right. They all became anti-Semites. They all became evil, horrible people that had to be overthrown. So I sat there watching this play out, and I got very frustrated and furious. I couldn't believe, why are we supporting communists? Well, here's what it looked like. Here's what the pre-color revolutions looked like for me on the ground while I was there. And it's pretty formulaic, let's be honest. First of all, target before the election. You have to target someone to win and lose before the election. The bad guy is already demonized as all of the things I've said before. Number two, control the media. The media has to almost be in lockstep. There might be one or two far-right publications or wacky publications, but how did we do that? How did the U.S. do that? Well, they simply subsidized all of the publications and media that peddled Foggy Bottom's line, that peddled the State Department line, in the name of open media and democracy, of course. And so they all, and, and they use cutouts like George Soros, uh, who has never done anything overseas in contradiction to the official U.S foreign policy. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is a fact. So you use these two things and you control the media. <clears throat> you pre-predict the outcome. Candidate X will win unless there's cheating going on. There's no question about it. The polls all agree. The polls, of course, are being done by the International Republican Institute and the National Democratic Institute, which are funded by the United States government. Uh, you announce if the unfavored candidate wins, of course, that means that there's cheating going on. So if you put all these together and you think about it, the United States is the country that invented the color revolution. And we stand here, ladies and gentlemen, a few days after the election in the middle of a color revolution, the process that we invented. The one thing that we said when we were there and we were writing about this and nobody wanted to hear what we had to say in the British Helsinki group was if we don't call attention to this, this will come to our shores eventually. Uh, it sounded conspiratorial at the time, but as things progressed and there became a real cover, color revolutions elsewhere uh, in the former East, we are living in it right now. This is what we're having. So what I wanna do as much as I can without getting into the woods, and a lot of you know all of this, but I want to talk a little bit how, about how the Russiagate hoax became the COVID hoax, became the election hoax, became the color revolution in the United States. So first of all, it doesn't matter what you think about Donald Trump. Uh, if any of you watch the Liberty Report, we've been very harsh with him. We've praised him when he's done good things. Hits a mixed bag at best. That is not important. What's important is that we've seen a four-year running PSYOP and coup attempt that's been engineered by the deep state, for lack of a better term, and uh, 
and continues with the intelligence community. So, A, why is Russiagate so important? I want to hit us with a couple of the highlights of it so we understand. First of all, the purpose is to establish the illegitimacy of the 2016 election. Once you establish that President Trump is illegitimately elected, of course, it's not only an option to do anything by whatever means necessary to overthrow it, it's almost a patriotic duty. Your president was put into office by a hostile foreign power, a hostile foreign intelligence service. If you are a good patriotic American, you have a duty to do anything. Wouldn't you stop at anything to, to, to stop this from going on? Establish, establish that. Anything is justified. Uh, we know a lot about Russiagate at this point. Uh, those of us paying attention, I know that all of you have, so some of this will be a rehash. But remember in September, the director of national intelligence, John Ratcliffe, here are just a couple of the highlights. Uh, he wrote a letter to Lindsey Graham, none of our favorite senator, as you, as you all know, but it had interesting and important information. The U.S. intelligence community had information, quote, alleging that U.S. presidential candidate Hillary Clinton had approved a campaign plan to stir up a scandal against U.S. presidential candidate Donald Trump by, telling, by tying him to President Putin and Russian hacking of the DNC. This is from the intelligence community. Remember, for the last four years, the left said, trust the intelligence community. Now they're saying, don't trust the intelligence community. Uh, but this is what they happened. It's important enough at the time that John Brennan, the director of central intelligence at the time and no friend of liberty, actually briefed President Obama on the situation, saying, Maybe they shared some plans, but saying that here's what Hillary's cooking up. And they passed the information on to two great patriotic Americans, uh, Jim Comey and Peter Strzok, uh, to investigate this, guys, right? <laughs> so, and then the second thing is the server hack that wasn't. Establish the narrative that the Russians hacked Hillary's server, and boom, you're off to the races. Uh, everything is set in motion. Uh, but what happened? Something weird happened. Why, they didn't call in the FBI, as we all know, which Comey himself said that would have been the best practices, but gosh, they didn't do it and we didn't push it. <laughs> so uh, the FBI was never given a report. The DNC contacted instead of the FBI a very corrupt company called CrowdStrike. Hey, come look at our servers. I think the Russians hacked into it. But, but don't tell the FBI, don't give them a report, right? And so here is the, um, in CrowdStrike, in public, Oh, went along with it. The Russians hacked it. The Russians hacked it. Didn't say a word. But something weird happened. When they were under oath, a, a testimony that was hidden until this year, they were singing a different tune. Uh, here's uh, Sean Henry, the president of CrowdStrike, under oath, we only heard about it in May, quote, there's no evidence the emails were actually exfiltrated. There's circumstantial evidence, but no evidence they were actually exfiltrated i.e. no evidence of a hack whatsoever. This is the guy who investigated. So that is, uh, I think, very important. Uh, in this same tranche of testimony that came out, uh, then DNI Clapper, uh, we all know him, here's what he said when he was under oath. I never saw any direct empirical evidence that the Trump campaign or someone in it was plotting or conspiring with the Russians to meddle in the election. Uh, what was he saying on TV at the same time that he was saying this? <laughs> As Trump would say, Russia, Russia, Russia. And they were on, they were on, he and Brennan were on every cable station you can imagine, hyping the Russia thing, hyping the Russia threat. But when they were under oath and they faced some time in the slammer, well, they were singing a different tune. It's very, very interesting. But what did Brennan and Clapper do after that? After, oh my gosh, Trump got elected. How did this happen? We, we, we did our best to fix things and it didn't work. Well, they released in January 2017, as we all know, a critical, critical document, the Intelligence Community Assessment. It sounds so official, although there's no such thing. Uh, the Intelligence Community releases the National Intelligence Estimate. Uh, it has several processes by which they produce their products. Well, this was something new. The analysts were handpicked by Brennan. Uh, he admitted it in Clapper. Interesting. There was no community-wide review. State Department didn't get a, a cut at it. The other different aspects of the intelligence community didn't get to take a cut at it. Here's the finished product. And the NSA itself said it didn't have a very high level of, 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 of confidence in the whole thing. What this was was the intelligence community investigating the intelligence community about a coup put on by the intelligence community. And that's what we've been facing now for the past few years. <clears throat> but what Russiagate established as well is this catch-all. Anytime bad news comes out, well, it was Putin. It was the Russians. If you dare even look at it, well, you're supporting Putin. Oh, my gosh, Hunter Biden's 
laptop. He's high on God knows what and puts his laptop somewhere. And in, on it, aside from the salacious parts, were pretty good evidence that some pretty serious stuff was going on involving his father, stuff that Trump was impeached over that Trump didn't do. So what happens? We see immediately everyone lockstep. Well, this was Russian disinformation, Russian disinformation. You had 50 former intelligence officers saying, we don't have any evidence, but this is all the hallmarks of Russian disinformation. Uh, so you can, you can you know, sort of delegitimize and nobody wanted to talk about it. Who wants to spread Russian disinformation unless you hate America? So that's Russiagate. Why is COVID so important and how does it tie together? <clears throat> Create mass hysteria using fake information and do it quick, do it right away. This new bug is 10 times more deadly than the flu. You'll be dropping like flies. Get, it's a pandemic. In the times of pandemic, you cannot expect things to work properly. How dare you go get your cancer treatments? You're selfish. Uh, so establish this, uh, create this mass hysteria, line up people whose entire professional existence is in obedience to the state. Uh, people like Neil Ferguson in the UK, the great prognosticator whose track record is, is the, the worst in history of predicting anything. You get someone like this, widely respected, and he comes out and says, well, if you do everything we say, you'll only lose two million people. And that set governments in motion across the world, literally. Uh, oh, let's emulate China and how they dealt with it. Let's lock everyone up. Great idea. The worst aspects of China, and there are some very good aspects of China, but the worst aspects of China. Well, by the time the narrative comes out, the narrative is established. If you go against it, you're, you're a kook. You're a bad person. You're selfish. Well, we find out now that the CDC says 99.9% .9 survival rate, if you get it. And if you're young, forget it. I mean, uh, literally, uh, the CDC director Redfield said five to six times as many kids are dying of the flu than have died of COVID. So anyway, get out early and establish the facts, establish the facts on the ground. Politicize the pandemic. That is so important. First of all, once it's politicized and it becomes very clear that one political side uh, of our great divide that Jeff talks about is in it, hook, line, and sinker, and that is basically Democratic Party supporters, and Joe Biden wasn't embarrassed about it. He said, I am going to be the president of lockdown and masks. Oh, well, that sounds like fun, but they sign on to it because it's a tribe. But unfortunately, the genius of this demonic plan is that you divide half of the right of the conservatives, wherever you want to call them, because you have these law and order conservatives, and whenever a, an official issues an edict, you're the first one to back the blue and stand in line and salute the flag and do whatever they say. And unfortunately, a lot of this they claim is Bible-based. So you have a lot of Bible believers saying, well, I have to support the civil government. I, 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 can't, I, can't, you know, I can't deny my religion. Even as the government itself is denying you your religion, it somehow it's okay. So you split the right, you split the opposition, uh, you destroy the ability to mobilize people uh, to fight this, uh, the, the, the so-called the pandemic, okay, under the politicization, once you've terrorized the population, what do you do? You crash the one thing that Trump depends on to get reelected, which is a, okay, we know better, but let's just, for, for, for game's sake, crash a great economy. We knew, and Dr. Paul often says it's, it's a house on sand. Never mind, the perception is it's a great economy. People want to vote for the person who's, are you better off now than four years ago? Of course, they would have, they would have gone for Trump. Uh, so crash the economy, terrorize a population, divide people, divide uh, people and keep them from uh, opposing this. And it justifies all the abuse that's heaped on people. Interestingly enough, particularly the abuse in the blue states with tyrannical governors, blue swing states with tyrannical governors. You had Whitmer in Michigan who is literally insane, wouldn't let you buy some radish seeds. And now she says, if you want to go out and get a hamburger, the restaurant has got to take your name, address, serial number, and, you know, so we can contact trace you. We had this lunatic in Pennsylvania, this health minister, a health fuhrer, whatever she was, he, uh, taking her mother out of the rest homes and then locking everyone else in the rest homes. Uh, two critical states, and it happened elsewhere. You, you all know this. We had deep state Fauci, a guy, again, who's made his entire career serving the state, 
offering it up. And, and, and hapless Trump, we know, I mean, any of us who have some affection for him, a very hapless guy to say the best. He went along with it until he found Atlas. But lockdown, lockdown, lockdown is what they talked about. So why is the election hoax so important? This is the third hoax, and I think it's the culmination of these three processes that have bewildered us over the years. Uh, and that is that this is how it all comes together. And here is how it all comes together. And here's just one example. Mark Elias. Has anyone heard of him before? Mark Elias is critical. He's from the Perkins Coey Law Firm. He was a former attorney for the Hillary Clinton campaign in 2016. He's from the Perkins Coey Law Firm. Very powerful. He is the guy who wrote the check and hired Fusion GPS to create the phony Steel Russia dossier. Washington Post identified him. This is not a conspiracy website. He's the guy who wrote the check and got the fake dossier going, which then was sent to the FBI to open a counterintelligence investigation on the Trump campaign and allow them to spy on the Trump campaign. This, we know this now, and it was all a lie. Well, after he did that, after he launched things in motion, he spent the Trump years, particularly the, uh, our, year, our era of the pandemic, leading the charge to change voting rules, particularly in these same swing states. Uh, he wanted to expand the vote by mail, uh, expand and enable ballot harvesting. It used to be if, you, if someone was going to take your vote, it had to be a family member and they had to prove uh, you know, my dad can't come in and vote. Here's his vote, and here's my ID. Now you have guys with, with boxes coming around, and, uh, oh, Mrs. Smith, are you sure you wanted to vote that way? <laughs> Remember what you told me? And so in enabling this harvesting of massive amounts of ballots and dumping them, and if you're, but if you're against counting them, of course, you hate democracy and you hate freedom. So the justification for putting through these changes that our friend, the wonderful civic-minded attorney, did was... COVID, people are terrified. How dare you make them go and physically vote and show their IDs and sign this? You are truly, you want people to die. And so this is what did it. And here's Hillary back in April. April, this is a quote, this is a tweet. States must take concrete steps now to make sure every citizen can be heard in November, no matter where we are by then in fighting the COVID pandemic. Sounds like she's laying the groundwork. So started by delegitimizing Trump through Russiagate, then using COVID to crash the economy and to enable the changing of voting rules across the country. And here we are in the middle again of a color revolution in the United States. And now the last thing I'm gonna do because, let me see if Jeff's gonna kick me off. Um, I'll do this quickly. Here's a color coup in 10 moves. And this is a hat tip to Pepe Escobar who did a great piece and I encourage people to have a look at it. Uh, but here's 10, here's 10 moves to the color, color, uh, color revolution. Cite a massive pandemic. Uh, kills, in reality, 0.1% of those who get it. <clears throat> we need mail-in ballots to be widespread as the safest way to, for people to vote. Endlessly publicize virtually every poll showing a massive landslide for Biden. Every poll, except for kooks. Use the pandemic to kill the one major thing that would make people re-elect Trump, which is aside from what we know, a good-looking economy on the surface. Um, Biden announces in, at Hillary's uh, uh, urging that he would not concede the election before the election under any circumstances. I will not concede this. The vote count on the night of the election, and many of you were sitting up like I was, running pretty smoothly, favoring Trump. Trump. Then all of a sudden, Fox News calls Arizona for Biden inexplicably with not very much of the vote counted, and certainly the vote in conservative areas not counted, uh, and, the, and all of a sudden the counting stops. Why did it stop? They stopped counting. What happened? Maybe they were checking how many votes they needed uh, to fix things. Number eight, 2 a.m., a first batch of mysterious votes starts pouring in. More than 130,000, I believe in Michigan, were delivered 100% for Biden. Statistically impossible. They said, oh, no, that, uh, we corrected that. Oh, if you corrected that, then why doesn't Trump have s some more votes? Uh, he keeps losing. Number nine, two to five percent of the shift toward Biden was made by morning. While we were sleeping, a massive shift from Trump 
to Biden occurred overnight. And some states were reporting 89% turnout. Uh, I mean, I think even Kim Jong-un would be happy to have that kind of turnout. <laughs> And then th the final step, statistical error results in a mass dump for Biden. Uh, but really, the big tech silences anyone who says something is going on here. Something is not right. Something is fishy. Uh, all of a sudden, the tweets are gone. The Facebook is gone. The media is gone. Only crazy people are questioning the most pristine, the most perfect election of all time. And so this is how... Russiagate became COVIDgate, became Electiongate, and here we are in the middle of the most uh, disturbing, I think, crisis, certainly in, in my lifetime. So thank you very much.